Welcome everyone to Après Midi. I'm very happy to have everybody here on this beautiful, warm, little bit gray July day in Paris. And I'm really pleased to introduce Whitney. Would you stand up, my dear? No, Whitney Cubison, who is a dual American and French citizen living in Paris since 2009. She grew up in Texas and California and graduated from UCLA with a degree in French. She started her career in communications working for high-tech PR agencies in San Francisco and eventually joined Microsoft, where she worked for 16 years, 13 of which from the Paris office. During that time, she held various international roles that encompassed public relations, employee communications, executive speech writing, and social media. So sh this woman is clued in. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> She earned her French citizenship in early 2022 and left Microsoft in the summer of that year to focus on completing her first novel. Voila. You want to hold one up? Will there be wine? The very important question. Spoiler alert, yes. Yes, there will be wine. The story, while fiction, is deeply inspired by Whitney's own experiences as an expat divorcee living in Paris and trying to navigate the cultural minefield of dating in a foreign country. She self-published the book on January 16, 2023 and has since sold more than 1,700 copies. A sequel entitled Will There Be Love is currently in the works. Whitney has books with her she is not going home with any of them. <laughs> that means, okay, that is your opportunity to buy a copy for yourself or no. any single girlfriend that you might know. Uh huh. For 15 euros, right? For 15 euros. 15 yes. euros. She will sign your copy, which is very important. So you have it on the shelf as a special copy. Yes. Okay. And uh, I. Turn it over to Whitney. All right. It's all yours. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, first Perfect. of all, thank you so much to everybody for coming. I'm thrilled to uh, see a basically sold out event. Uh, sold out free event, but sold out event. We're going to count it. Um, so thanks, Adrian, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here. Um, very happy. So she gave you a little bit of my background and intro, but I'll tell you a little bit more about me just to start. Um, a lot of people ask, how did you end up in Paris? Logical question. I grew up in Texas, uh, in Houston. I have the whole tragic Whitney Houston thing. <laughs> French people think that's hilarious. Um, so I am Whitney Houston, <laughs> Whitney from Houston, whatever. Anyway, um, growing up in Texas, everybody took Spanish as their default language because you're right near the Mexican border. And I apparently have been a bit of a rebel for my entire life and therefore decided to take French for no particular reason. Um, and then when I was 16, I came to tour on a, uh, an exchange with my high school for two weeks. And I fell so in love with France and with the family that I stayed with for those two weeks in tour that I decided to major in French at UCLA. I had this idea that you, know, you should do what you love and uh, the rest is gonna sort itself out. And somehow I was right, which is miraculous. And um, I'm still in touch with those folks in tour. I've told them in no uncertain terms that those couple of weeks changed the path of my life um, and ended me up here, which is really cool. So uh, as Adrian said, I worked at Microsoft for 16 years in communications. Uh, I left two years ago this month. And at that point, I had already written the second draft of this book. Um, and so I decided that after COVID and losing my dad right after COVID, I decided that it was time to take a minute um, and do something that just fulfilled, filled my cup back up because it was empty. Um, after those COVID years and after losing my dad, I just said, you know, now, if not now, when is the moment to um, start something new, to go into a totally different creative path. Um, and so I uh, finished the book, published it in January of 2023. Um, and uh, now, yeah, now I'm working on the sequel. So that's a little bit about how I got here today. Um, and um, yeah, so it's a bit of a second life for me. It's just a career change, a redo, do over. I think a lot of expats end up having a little bit of that too. At some point I'm seeing some heads <laughs> nodding, that's good. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm just at the beginning of that new second life and uh, it's been great. I've been really enjoying it. So 
Um, that's a little bit about me, um, but I would love before I get deeper to know a little bit about you. So by show of hands, I would love to know who in the room is um, a tourist here, here just visiting. Okay, all right. Just not too few, many. Not too many. And so everybody <laughs> else lives here. Yeah, yeah. okay, look, okay, good. Lots of, lots of folks. Um, next question, who is single? <laughs> okay, and married? Okay, great. Um, who has ever tried a dating app? <laughs> All right. Um, wait, wait, wait. Ask how many times? <laughs> no, we won't, we're not going to get that personal today. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and for the rest, I hope you're a little bit curious about that slice of life, which uh, I can tell you is an absolute jungle, um, uh, enough so that I wrote a whole book about it. So uh, anyway, without further ado, I think the, the best place to start on a book is the beginning. And so I thought just to get you in the groove of what the book's about, I'll just read the first paragraph, just so you get a little taste of how this story starts. Uh, <laughs> drum, uh, roll, so drum, drum roll, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right, so this is from chapter one. It's called The City of Love. Paris was supposed to be the epicenter of romance, where all great love stories began. But for Austin Keller, it was where her marriage died. It was a slow death, dragged out over two long years, made longer by Parisians penchant for PDA public displays of affection. Nothing truly puts heartbreak into focus, like seeing countless couples making out in every absurdly charming cafe <laughs> and on every cinematic street corner. In Paris, love was oxygen, and Austin was gasping for breath. Aww. So that's how it starts. <laughs> So uh, as Adrian mentioned, the story is uh, deeply inspired by real events. Um, I am an expat divorcee. Um, I did live here for two years with my then husband and, um, and started over. I, I decided that I wanted to write this book after having been out on about a thousand really truly horrific dates um, where all of my friends said, you cannot make this up, you must write a book. Um, and so I did. Um, and so I, I decided that um, I wanted to just start. I didn't know if I was going to finish it. I just said, why not? I'll start. I'll get going. I'll write down some of the stuff that really happened. And then there was so much of it that I went, eh, actually, no, I think there is something here. Um, but to, to start off and get you a little bit in the spirit, I thought I would read. Um, is a thousand like real? Is, uh, I, did, I wasn't counting. Um, but it's, it's, it's not that far off. Uh, let's just say it's not that far off. So in the book, Austin, the character, has a blog. And so she writes about her horrible dates in first person. Um, and I will tell you, they're pretty much all true. Uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, however, uh, they're all pretty much true. So I thought I would read one, maybe two, depending on how, how you go. This one, um, this is my favorite. It's called uh, Xavier the Sexist. Occasionally, dear readers, I doubt myself. Is my list of rules too long? Am I missing out on good guys that maybe just don't look good on paper? I was in this frame of mind when I matched with Xavier. In the bare minimum of exchanges, I discovered we were neighbors. So when he very quickly asked me out, I decided to throw caution to the wind and meet him the next day for a drink. Normally, I would have done more of a pre-qualification, but for whatever reason, the date was on. All I knew was that he lived nearby and bore a striking resemblance to Ryan Gosling, <laughs> which I had made a mental note of even before he casually pointed it out. <laughs> We agreed to meet at the Parc Georges Brassens, just a few minutes from where I live. Two hours before the date, he texted me. So, how does it feel to have a date with the best looking guy in Paris's 15th oh. arrondissement? I rolled my eyes so hard I almost pulled an eye muscle and seriously contemplated canceling, but chose to reply, working against my better instincts. Modest, I see. <laughs> he claimed it was a joke, but by that point I was officially not feeling great about the prospects of the afternoon. I arrived at the entrance to the park and, seeing no sign of him, sat down on the bench to wait. Immediately, my phone rang. I see you. I'm in by the fountain. Come on in, he said. 
I got up feeling slightly awkward, knowing he was watching me walk toward him well before I was able to spot him. We'd agreed to meet outside the park gates, presumably to head to one of the two cafes just opposite, but clearly he had other ideas. We said our hellos, sat down on the bench, and started the small talk. He said he'd brought a blanket if we wanted to sit on the grass and talk, or we could go to a cafe as we'd discussed. I was wearing a short dress, so I pointed out that sitting on the ground maybe wasn't ideal. Don't worry, I won't look, he replied. So the grass it was, awesome. <laughs> the small talk shifted to work, and he told me about how he'd just been let go from his job. He was pretty incredulous about the whole thing, saying that the boss had it out for him and spending a lot of energy explaining the office politics between this guy and that girl and the other one, none of whom I knew, obviously. He was clearly not happy with the situation, so I tried to turn the conversation around by asking him what he loved to do and therefore what he thought he might do next. I'll stay doing what I'm doing now, of course, but there are just not that many jobs out there where you make 100,000 euros a year, he replied. Was he French? Mm -hmm. <laughs> French discussions of money have always fascinated me. Some claim that the subject is totally taboo, that no one talks about how much money they make. But Xavier wasn't the first man to tell me his salary very early in a potential relationship. It was weird. But the conversation continued, and about an hour into the date, and pretty much out of nowhere, he said, I find you very agreeable. I think we should see each other again. Do you agree? I hesitated for a bit too long, and he looked genuinely perplexed by my reluctance, furrowed brow and everything. I, declined, I decided to proceed with caution as my spidey senses had started to tingle. I'm not sure yet, I replied, honestly. Why? He demanded to know. They say feedback is a gift, so I decided to shoot straight. Well, Xavier, I mentioned that sitting on the grass wasn't ideal for me since I'm wearing this dress, and yet here we are. I've mentioned twice that I recently went on a great vacation and you didn't even ask me where I went. And you've spent most of the past hour talking about yourself. So I think maybe you're just a little too focused on you. <laughs> well, that's just not right, he returned snippily. We've only been talking for an hour and of course I was going to ask you about you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you can't decide that I'm not for you after only an hour. I decided not to tell him that it usually took 15 minutes or less for me to know if there was going to be a second date. But he spent the next 15 minutes explaining that we were both attractive, smart, and interesting, so clearly we were a great match. I played nice and eventually made my excuses to go, saying I had plans to meet a friend. He asked me again as I said goodbye if we were going out again. I smiled, said we'd text, and walked away. And then the text storm started. I said I'd like to see you again, with pleasure, so the ball is in your court. I admit I don't understand your hesitation, but will respect it, of course, if you don't want to see me. But at least my point of view is clear. I didn't respond straight away because A, I wasn't interested, and B, I also was indeed in transit to meet my friend. And then, 30 minutes later, a second ping. I'm waiting for an answer. It's not normal to hesitate when a date was that good on so many key criteria. It's a yes or a no. Don't overcomplicate things. <laughs> Listen, Xavier, it's a no. Uh, you're a nice guy, but not a match for me. Sorry. Wishing you lots of luck, personally and professionally. And then the texts just started flying in, one after another. Can you tell me why? I'm bilingual, good job, good-looking Parisian guy. So where is the problem? It's frankly humiliating for me. Who do you think you are? I'm not enough for you? Incredible. I've never experienced anything like this. No wonder you're alone. <laughs> you must have a crazy collection of sex toys. Incredible. Too bad I was only interested in your big boobs anyway. Bye. But I want a valid reason. I can't believe you walked away from me like that. No one does that to me. The buy followed by the but I want a valid reason was truly where he hit his low point and he'd already set the bar quite low and it wasn't over. I'm waiting for a reason or several. Go ahead. I'm waiting. I hate cowards. So what is your problem? Is it that I make more money than you? After that last message, I blocked him, and not because he didn't have a good job or make more money than me, but, but really, in the history of time, has any woman ever had a problem with a guy making more money than her? It was all just so ridiculous. 
I briefly considered sending him a reply saying, oh honey, you don't make more money than me. Or perhaps less snarkily, remember an hour ago when you, you, you said you'd respect my choice if I didn't want to see you again? Is this what you think respect looks like? But the poor thing was clearly a fragile narcissist with anger management issues and my neighbor. So I decided the better choice was to take the high road and put a giant roadblock up behind myself so he couldn't pass. Now I just have to pray to the gods of the 15th arrondissement that we never cross paths in the streets close to home. <laughs> ah. So I will say, as a sidebar to that story, I was well into writing the book when that guy asked me out. And in a normal situation, had I not been writing the book, I think I would have canceled after the, how does it feel to have a guy with a, a date with the best looking guy in the 15th? I think I would have just been like, yeah, no. Uh, but I was like, this one's going to be good for the book. I'm going. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> so, so there's one. So yeah, it turned out to be better than you even expected. I mean, like, I've gotten a lot of mileage off of that day <laughs> yeah. in the end. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, it, it is what it is. Uh, you take the good from the bad, right? That's just life. Um, so anyway, there were a lot of stories, funny stories like that, where I had started writing and, and then at some point I decided well, I didn't want it to be just a bunch of slapstick. I wanted it to carry some kind of deeper meaning as well and, and have a commentary about living abroad, about expat life, um, about cultural differences as well. And often uh, a question that I get when I'm talking about the book or dating or relationships in general is, what is the biggest difference between dating American men and dating Frenchmen? So here's my, here's my thing. Um, in America, when you go out with somebody, you can be going out with them for some number of days, weeks, months. You can be sleeping with them. You can be doing all kinds of things. And if you haven't had the define the relationship conversation, you are not in a relationship. You're just dating. This is how it works in America. It's very bizarre. Here, um, people meet, they eventually fall into bed. And then the, the next morning, you know, you're either a one night stand or you're in a couple. And it happens that fast. And I learned that the hard way, too. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't read this, chap this passage because it's, I don't know, a little bit long. But um, my first French boyfriend, who's in, now in a chapter called The First French Boyfriend, and yes, he knows that he's in the book and he's cool with it. I gave him the right to read it before. He was cool. Um, we, um, we had met. We had been talking for a couple of months. We'd gone out. We eventually end up in bed together. We wake up the next morning. It was, in real life, it was in May. And he looked at me and he said, so what are you doing for vacation in August? And I was like, I don't even know your last name. <laughs> Why are we talking about what's happening in August? I mean, I almost fell out of bed. I would have run, except it was my apartment. So, you know, I did it. Um, but, but as an American, that really shocked me because the idea that after one night together, you would be talking about things months in advance, it just doesn't happen. But it does here. Um, so that was, that was a cultural discovery um, that is, has been the biggest difference in my experience so far. Um, and so I wanted to uh, read one other little passage that's also about cultural differences. So this scene, um, I think it's this one. Yes, this scene, Austin is at a dinner party with, um, a, with a bunch of couples. She's the only single girl in the room. And so naturally the conversation goes to dating and you know, what's it like and all of that stuff. And so this is a conversation, um, this is picking up sort of in the middle. So hopefully there's enough context. I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So uh, here we go. And no one seems to know any good single men. Do any of you know any, she asked. Heads shook all around the table. Austin continued, directing a disclaimer to Emmanuel and Sebastian. I don't know either of you, so at the risk of further insult, I will share my theory about why there are no single men in France. The whole table leaned in, <laughs> eager to hear it. Relationships are trees, and in each perfect tree, there are two monkeys, all loved up in the beautiful branches far above the ground. If the male monkey gets unhappy, he will leave his tree by taking a giant swing toward another tree, toward another woman. He has a genuine fear of his feet touching the ground, otherwise known as being single. <laughs> Austin scanned the table to make sure everyone was following. They're with me so far, she thought, seeing smiles and nodding heads. However, if the female monkey gets unsatisfied, she climbs down the tree to walk around for a while to reground herself. 
when she eventually starts looking for her next monkey man, she is disappointed in what she finds on the ground. Why is she disappointed, Isabel asked, keeping the conversation flowing. Swallowing the last sip of the superb Chateauneuf de Pape in her glass, she continued, excellent question. It's because all the male monkeys on the ground are there because they got kicked out of their tree or fell and hit their head on something. <laughs> and the vast majority are suffering from a primate concussion which leaves them fundamentally flawed and totally undateable. <laughs> Sebastian moved to refill her glass and braved the first re reply. I think you're right. I know one single guy and he is undateable. And if I think about it, most of my friends who've left relationships recently did go directly into a new one and I left a relationship to be with Celine. You may have nailed it. Austin couldn't help but notice that Celine seemed to bristle at the anecdote, her shoulders hunched inwards. It's true that men are not good at being alone, Luke conceded. You're probably onto something there. So now, Iso, we just have to think about whether any of our friends are about to leave their wives or girlfriends who might be a good match for Austin. <laughs> Isabel patted him on the arm condescendingly. Sure, honey, let's root for the demise of our friends' relationships so we can shuffle them around to our other single friends. <laughs> That'll make for some fucking great dinner parties in the future and send absolutely no one into couples therapy. Everyone laughed except for Celine, who Austin noticed was becoming increasingly agitated. She started to scratch furiously at a spot on the tablecloth with her light pink fingernail. All other eyes went to Emmanuel as the one man who hadn't weighed in. His gaze darted around the room as if he was looking for an answer. He then said, you're right that it's easier to leave one relationship for another. Who wants to be alone? You don't, because here we are talking about this. So I'll offer you my own theory in return about why. He raised one eyebrow at Austin, almost daring her to object. She liked the challenge and nodded in encouragement. I dated an American girl before Kiara, he began. Kiara feigned shock, explaining, I thought you'd never met another woman before me. She's Italian. Uh, he kissed her forehead. Yes, dear, it's only ever been you. Just don't listen to this story. As he continued, he kept one hand on Kiara's thigh, which Austin found an adorable gesture of reassurance. What I observed was that for you American girls, love somehow needs to be all or nothing. It's fireworks, hearts, and flowers, or it's a no-go. For us French, there are many in-between possibilities which can be right under different circumstances, he explained. She told me that when you were little girls, you pulled petals off flowers saying, he loves me, he loves me not. Do you know the equivalent for French girls? She shook her head. In France, it's il m'aime un peu, beaucoup, passionnement, à la folie, pas du tout. He loves me a little, a lot, passionately, madly, or not at all. It isn't black and white, you see. It's at least five shades of gray, and any of them can be good for a given moment, except perhaps the not at all bit, so four different shades, but that's twice as many as you Americans have. I thought there were 50 shades of gray, Luke cracked. I've got your 50 right here. Isabel kissed Luke square on the mouth, and he pulled her onto his lap. They're adorable, Austin thought, before turning her attention back to Emmanuel. Maybe you just need to adapt to the French way and open up to the possibility of something in the middle being enough, he concluded. I'm logging that one for later. Got to think about it. Very interesting, she thought. Kiara broke her train of thought, taking the conversation back to fashion. You need to start trying men on like t-shirts from Zara. It's Zara, <laughs> so who cares if you only wear it once? But maybe it becomes a favorite t-shirt that you wear for years. You never know until you try it on. Not everyone needs to look or feel like a Chanel suit to be worth a go. Even Kate Middleton wears Zara from time to time. <laughs> There's the solution. Wear Zara and find my prince, Austin exclaimed, banging her hand flat onto the table. Thank God we've got that sorted. What would I do without you people? <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so the cultural differences is something that definitely plays into the storytelling. I've, as uh, Adrian mentioned, I've been here for 15 years, and so you learn a lot as you uh, go out and meet people from different cultures, and there are always, like, things that you misunderstand, things that you misinterpret, and definitely via text message and apps. That tech, I'm a professional, former professional communicator, and I can tell you with confidence that text messaging is the worst form of communication in the entire world. There are so <laughs> many opportunities for misunderstanding, for, for not understanding the context. There was one guy, this, was, this is also not in the book, but there was a guy that sent me um, a, a text that, that said something like, c'est pas bientôt fini d'être si belle which if you literally translate it says, isn't it gonna be over soon that you're so pretty? And I was like, oh! I was very insulted. But apparently in French, that's actually a really nice, uh, can you stop being so pretty? Oh. Totally missed it, 
just uh, deleted them immediately. And then my French friend was like, no, that was nice. I was like, oh, whoops. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> it happens. Um, so um, the last kind of theme that I, want to talk, that I wanted to talk about that was very important to me in this book was about female friendship and about how the, the great work that women do to kind of support each other and hold each other up in all of these uh, trials and tribulations of dating and just in life in general. So if it's all right, I'll read one last passage that's from uh, Austin's. Um, Austin goes to the south of France with her two best friends from college for their 40th birthday. So they've been spending the week in the south of France just kind of doing their thing. And um, I think I wanted to start it here. But American uh, friends, American right? friends, yes. Ah, OK. Uh, American friends. So th this female friendship discussion is not really related to dating, but it's a big theme in the book, so I wanted to read something. So here's what it says. As they munched on pizza and the sun started to dip below the horizon, Liz let out a dramatic sigh. Who was that bitch that said we were supposed to want it all? I swear there are days where I want none of it. I want to be able to sit on the couch in my pajamas all day for one Saturday, just one, and have no one need anything from me. Milena looked alarmed. What's happening? Where did this come from? Liz jumped out of her chair and started to pace. I'm a doctor, a mom, a wife, a daughter, a sister, and a friend. Most days I love wearing all of those hats, but lately it feels like a lot. When people ask me how I'm doing, I say, I'm just ducky. Ducky, Austin and Milena asked in unison. Her arms started to move in slow, shallow waves. On the surface, I'm gliding across, looking all smooth, but underneath, I am paddling like hell. That's a good one. I'm gonna get you a small army of yellow rubber ducks for Christmas, Austin cackled. Liz collapsed back in her chair. Oh God, don't make me think about Christmas with all the presents and the lights and the caroling and the baking and Jesus, the pressure. Did you mean Jesus the birthday boy or are you cursing? <laughs> Milena asked with a laugh. Liz let out a scream. Both, Jesus, why are we talking about Christmas? Austin tried and failed to suppress her giggles. Duff Army, sorry, no more Christmas. Seriously, what's going on with you? Liz took a slow, deep breath. This week with you two is the most relaxed I've been in years. You don't seem that relaxed, Austin scrunched up her nose and cocked her head. The gesture turned her statement into a question. Liz guzzled Rosé. I love my family and my kids in all their insane, glorious splendor. I love my job, working with these elite athletes. I'm so lucky Andrew is willing to be able to be a stay-at-home dad. Her voice, her voice trailed off. But it's a lot of pressure on you, Milena guessed. Yes, sometimes I think it'd be easier if I could love it all just a little bit less, Liz confessed. I wouldn't trade any of it for the world, but damn, I really needed this trip. Austin rubbed Liz's back in a circular motion. All that pressure is one of many reasons I never had kids. Also, I like sleeping in my perky boobs and not sharing my ice cream. <laughs> Milena threw her a, you're not helping, stare. I hate you, Liz replied, smiling. Seriously, how the hell are we 40 years old? Weren't we young and carefree at university like 15 minutes ago? Adulting sucks. I constantly feel guilty for not being able to give everyone 100% of my energy. Is that terrible to admit? Absolutely not, Milena insisted. Everyone needs and deserves a break. Austin spread her arms wide toward the horizon um, and the speck of sun that was rapidly descending into the sea. Look where we are. Does adulting suck, really? We have the privilege to take time for ourselves, which makes us better at being all the things we need to be. No one can do it all the time, so we do this. We're mere mortals, despite what we may want others to believe. They were all quiet, reflecting for a few moments until Milena broke the silence. I, recent, I read a quote recently from this writer in Uruguay, Eduardo Galeano, he said, we are all mortal until the first kiss and the second glass of wine. Isn't it perfect? Is he single? Austin asked. He sounds like my dream guy. <laughs> Milena laughed. I think he's in his 70s. I thought Sam was your dream guy, Liz interjected, killing the laughter. When are you sending the email? Austin stood up, pulled the bottle of Minuti out of the ice bucket on the table. I'm not ready yet. Still thinking, constantly. For now, I will follow Eduardo and Milena's lead have a second glass of wine in the noble quest for immortality. She took a dramatic bow. <laughs> so those were the, the readings that I prepared. I do have one other story that I'll tell and then we can open up and ask questions if anybody has any. But uh, this story is very timely this week. It's not in the book, it almost made the book. And it was a story um, right when I was getting divorced. My husband and I had a dog here, Pongo, God rest his soul. Um, and we had a very cute veterinarian. 
And um, <laughs> we took Pongo to the vet to get his papers to fly back to America because Pongo was taking his retirement in Texas with my family um, after our divorce. And so I got there first with the dog and, and my husband came to meet us there. And so before he arrived, we were talking, the vet was like, okay, so how long is Pongo gonna be in the States? And I said, indefinitely, and he said, why? And I said, um, because my parents got him in the divorce. And he was like, what, who's divorced? I said, mine. He was like, you're divorced? And I said, yeah, and he was like, <laughs> so then right about then, the ex-husband shows up, we do the appointment, and then we're leaving, and he walks us out, and he shakes his hand and says, you know, have a nice life, whatever, he pets the dog, have fun in Texas. He grabs my hand and pulls me in a little and says, get a cat, <laughs> <laughs> and lets me go. And I was like... <laughs> So afterwards, I found him on Facebook. I'm like, I'm pretty sure get a cat meant you wanted to see me again, question mark. He was like, yes, can I take you to dinner? And I was like, yes. And so we went out twice and he ended up being kind of boring. However, the, the, reason, that, uh, the reason that it's an interesting story now and a timely story now is just this week, I rematched with him on a dating app. And I saw him pop up and I was like, oh. And so my first message to him on the app was, uh, I still tell the story all the time about get a cat, best pickup line of my life. Oh. And he wrote, wrote me back and says, do we know each other? <laughs> <laughs> he remembered when I reminded him, but I was like a little disappointed. But that was for me, it was like best pickup line of my life. And he's like, who are you again? Oh. Anyway, can't win them all. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you again for coming. And um, happy to answer any questions if you have them. <laughs> oh my god hilarious and, and that's what the book is like by the way it's one funny story after another it, it is a, rom a, ram a romantic comedy it is a rom-com when i try to it needs the, to be a sitcom when i give the pitch i say it's about an american divorcee expat who moves to paris gets divorced and tries mostly unsuccessfully to restart her love life with frenchmen um that's you know, the really, the, that's the elevator pitch. But uh, there, is, there is some, um, she does end up with somebody uh, at the end, without spoilers, she does end up with somebody. And so the sequel, which is called Will There Be Love, is about the beginning of their relationship. And it's really about love and kind of where it starts and where it ends and what builds it and what breaks it, but told through the lens of two primary couples, them and another couple. The woman is his first love and her current husband. So anyway, that's the next one. It's, uh, I'm just about done with the second draft and uh, don't have a release date yet, but uh, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm on Whitney Cubs and Writes, um, then you will get all the news whenever it's ready. Any other questions or, yeah. Well, it's actually uh, just something I wanted to share with you and the group, which is just from the male perspective. This is a funny thing that happened to me just a, a month ago. I'm on Bumble, and I had a coffee date with someone. Mm -hmm. We had a very nice time. We made a plan to go to the Louvre one week later on the weekend. And two days later, I had a coffee date with someone else. Mm -hmm. This woman who I had met saw me in the coffee date. Ooh, bad luck. Ooh. I, I didn't know that. And then when I texted her to mm -hmm. ask, uh, you know, to confirm our plans for the Louvre. Um, she was mad? Yeah, she actually cut me off. She, and I there there that is so, crazy I mean, everywhere. So, no, but I think that, <laughs> because I've actually shared that with a few French uh, female friends. Yeah. And they're like, well, that's a little strong, but I understand because in France, that's like one coffee date, if you make another plan, you're married. Whew, gosh. Uh, um, I, had, I had another, I had another. <laughs> I had another right. woman, He's after, right. after three dates, we went to this church. She said, oh, I want to stop into this church. And she's like, oh, yeah, this is the church where my parents were married. And then before I knew it, we were like, let's light a candle together. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, listen, I am not claiming that women have the uh, full authority on dra drama in dating. It's, uh, I've heard plenty of stories from the male perspective, too. and. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of crazy out there um, on all sides. It is a jungle. Um, so I uh, say, um, you know, good for all of us who are out there trying because it's a jungle out there. And but, that uh, boils, but, but that boils down back to your, one of your cultural comments, yeah. right? Well, but if, you, like, if you've never even kissed and you've been out for coffee once, sorry, not married yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, she's crazy. 
<laughs> you probably escaped. You dodged a bullet there. Be happy. Uh, but yeah, that seems like a lot. That seems like a lot. I get it if you've like, you know, hooked up and whatever. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. then you're in a couple. But if you've been out for coffee once, I don't think it counts. I don't know. Maybe this is why I keep failing at it. <laughs> <laughs> Whitney, you know they, they grow up differently. Yes, I do. I do. And that's the beautiful thing about living and dating in another country is learning about all of these things and learning about all the idiosyncrasies. And I'm all for it. Like I've been doing this dating app thing for the better part of the last 13 years. So I, I, I keep going because I find it very curious and interesting and you learn a lot and, and I'm all for it. Um, but it does make for some potentially dramatic uh, misunderstandings and misconnections and, you know, all, all chances of screwing things up. I mean, the relationships start, they're different and they start from a very early age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my daughter grew up here. Right. And so, like in the States, the boys and the girls are very separate. Yeah. And then they date. It's and very here, different. There's no, not even a word in the French language for right, dating, for which they tells don't you date. everything. Yeah. No. And the boys and girls are very much together mm -hmm. and then they sort of pair up. Yeah. Yeah. It's so a it's very a very different, MO. different, right. Yeah. That's right. Wendy, do you have a question? I just was wondering, tell me what your favorite Dating apps are. <laughs> <laughs> favorite dating apps. Favorite dating apps. Um, the, my usual is Bumble. My usual is Bumble. I agree. It's the best. Utah and in France. Yeah, that's the one that I like. I've tried them all. I, I basically I, I call Tinder the bar that everybody goes to. Uh, it's like the numbers are there, but it could be anything. Bumble I find is a bit more qualified. Um, there's so many to choose from, and there's always new ones, but I don't know. Bumble keep is the one I keep going back to. Yeah, I've been trying Hinge, too, but I'm not... Is it still in, here, in France? Is it you have to make the first move on Bumble? They here? just stopped that. Okay. So, yeah, the, the question was, is the, does the woman always have to make the first move, which was true for most of, for all of Bumble, so like up until recently. Ago. Yeah, they changed it. So now it's a free-for-all. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Have I ever been frightened by a French guy? Um, uh, other than that one that I read that was a little, a little scary? No. No, I have not. And I'm just going to knock on wood. Um, I feel like um, I have never had a bad situation like that. I've heard plenty of, of things that have happened in that realm, but most of those stories are in the States. I don't know. And maybe it's just a numbers game and there's just more people in the States, so, and I'm just not hearing the stories here, but I have had the very good fortune of not having anything dramatic. I also tend to qualify people quite a lot before I meet them, and you only ever meet in a public place. Um, so, you know, it's like some people are like, oh, you want to come over? I'm like, absolutely not. Like, not on your life. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes you weed out some of the crazy just by asking the right questions in advance. Um, but no, I've been very uh, fortunate in my many, many, many dates to have not run into a bad egg. Other questions? Uh, Paris is a very international city. It is. Did you have any notable experiences with folks from other cultures aside from Parisian? Yes. Um, there are some in the book. <laughs> uh, it's not all Frenchmen in the book. Yes. I mean, I like to say that I'm an equal opportunity dater. I'll date you know anybody for the right reasons. Um, so I'm not limiting myself to Frenchmen. I was at the beginning because my ex-husband was still is American. Um, and uh, so I was like, okay, to have a proper French experience, like I'm only dating Frenchmen. And then I, um, I met this Australian guy, and I remembered how easy it is to date in your native language. And I went, okay, that's over. Now I'm, now I'm an equal opportunity dater. Um, and I do speak French fluently, but there is something that just kind of gets lost in translation. Your personality is never quite 100% what it is in your native language. And so I have, um, I mean, we're in France, so there's a lot of French guys. You know, um, but but yeah, I'm not against others, and there have been there have been others. I dated a, a, an Italian guy who's not in the book. I dated this Australian guy who is. There was an American guy somewhere in the mix there too. But um, yeah, most of the all the blog entries are about the French. Who I, I got French citizenship two two years ago. I have to say I love France. I really do love France. Very happy to to be here. Very happy to be French. Um, but yeah, the cultural differences in this uh, dating game have been no joke. Uh, Right or wrong? <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, so I was just going to ask, speaking of the cultural differences, did you ever feel like it was too much difference, that it was so much pressure that you were like, I'm going back home? Or did you ever have a moment where you
you but like that's it i'm done yeah, have I ever given up? Um, given up? Have I ever given up on Frenchmen? No, um, I haven't. I'm still here. Adrian and I talked about this a little bit before. She was like, mm, just forget it. Um, <laughs> I, I remain, um, despite all evidence to the contrary, a wild, ho hopelessly optimistic romantic. Um, and so I believe that you know, my guy's out there. Whether he's French, I don't know. But I think that if you're dating, I'm 48. So I think if you're dating at 48 anywhere in the world, it's hard. Um, and so I don't think moving home is going to suddenly make it so much easier. Right. Um, and, and I think I, you know, I'd rather be, like, just like I studied French because I loved it, I'd rather live where I love and think yes. that life is going to find me. Um, and so, no, I've not given up yet. <laughs> <laughs> They do. They think we're easy. <laughs> Without getting too colorful, that's what they think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just not yes, going to end it right there. But <laughs> that's what American men think of French women. True. Also true. Oh, every fr every French woman I know has ever lived in the states. It's the fr they just. They found that men thought French women were easy. Yep. Absolutely. That has been my oh, experience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I love breaking stereotypes, by the way. Uh, we're, all, we're all here for that. Um, any other questions? Well, what's your advice? About what? Dating? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I will, I will. I will. I will give you my advice. Maybe wait for the siren to go by. Um, <laughs> they're, they're coming for me. Um, <laughs> So when I first, I mean, there, so in the book, there's three chapters that are called the internet. The internet round one, the internet round two, and the internet round three. And in each round, what Austin slash me um, chose to do was to be a little bit more honest about who she actually was. Because at the beginning, I was like, I'm not going to put that I've traveled to 72 countries. I'm not going to put that I went to UCLA. I'm not going to put anything that might intimidate someone because I don't want to people to rule me out before because I'm you know kind of cool and relaxed and maybe that's scary and then what I realized over time was actually that's a great weeding out mechanism yeah. <laughs> because if they're gonna be intimidated by me cut yeah. next yeah. and good and so my advice is be you yeah, <laughs> yeah. anything else uh, what about the men in here? Don't they have advice? Um, I have been told, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm t very happy to take any, any feedback from the men. I have been told that this is a great what not to do manual for men. Uh, so, you know, just to, uh, as an idea. Um, good for single men as well, perhaps. Um, but uh, no, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a jungle on both sides. I mean, I really have heard some horrible stories from my guy friends, too. And uh, like one, one of them was like, oh, this woman told me that if we were going to date, here was a very specific list of gifts she would like to receive during our what? dating. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's crazy everywhere. Like, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of weird. But there's a lot of success with dating apps, too, there are. isn't there? There is. There, uh, allegedly, yes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what they tell us. No, I know plenty of people who have met people yeah. on the dating apps. And one of the guys that's in, in the book is someone I met on Tinder, actually. So, yeah, it happens. It's a um, lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem that I have is that it's very hard to meet people outside of apps these days because in especially here i don't know if it's still true in the u.s but in the in the u.s like if i was in a bar with a girlfriend in new york there was always some guy coming up and talking to us and chatting here that doesn't happen so here it's cafe culture where everybody sat down amongst themselves in their little group talking amongst themselves and nobody ventures out and like in london it's pub culture where everybody stood up at the bar talking to each other and it's i think easier to mix but here, and, and it's also a, an after effect of me too, where guys are just terrified of, of approaching people. And I've had many guys explain this to me as like, they don't wanna make a false step, they don't wanna get shot down. They have just like retreated to behind their screens unless you meet somebody through friends, but they're all, you know, everybody's married, just per the monkey analogy. Um, <laughs> and, and so, it, yeah, I found that it's just really hard to meet somebody outside of the apps. Um, there's been twice, I think, in my 13 years of being single here where I've met someone in the wild that I've continued to see. <laughs> Up in the tree? <laughs> On the ground. Oh. Um, one of them wasn't French, uh, so, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, 
it's sadly become really the default way to meet people. And, and I also, there's another just, I don't know, this is a funny story, but you know when you're driving in your car and somebody cuts you off and you yell at them and it's road rage and it's the kind of thing that you would never say, you never dare yell or say the kinds of things that you say behind the protection of your windshield. <laughs> the apps are the same way now, where people dare to say these things and you're like, what would your mother say if she heard you say that to some girl you've never met? I mean, it's shocking actually, the kinds of things that people dare to say um, that, yeah, you just, it's just degraded the, the dating culture has degraded, I think, significantly as a result of the dating apps. I hate them, I love them. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I have a question that is not dating and romance related, yes. but about publishing. Yes. Um, anything you want to share about that process, that journey, sure. any kind of cross cultural insights, the difference between publishing here or in the US? Or so, yeah, I, I cannot give a full answer to that. Is anybody uh, published or thinking about being published? No? Okay, yeah, we got a writer there. Um, so I self-published um, because I wanted my books in English, obviously, um, and so I wasn't going to publish here because French publishers are looking for things in French. So that kind of wrote that out immediately. Um, to get published by a big five publishing house in the U.S., you have to get an agent first, and then it's the agent that sells you into the publishing house. So after the second draft of this book, I did pitch agents, and I had initial interest from five, which was very exciting, but then none of them actually offered to represent me in the end. So what that told me was that the idea was good, but the execution wasn't good enough. And so then I hired a freelance book editor to work with me to polish, help me polish it up. And once I was done with that, I could have started repitching. But to pitch agents, it usually takes them between three to six months to get back to you, um, to d even decide if they want to represent you. And then there's the whole, and I was like, I don't want to wait that long. I'm ready. I feel confident that it's ready to go. And so I'm self-publishing. And so Amazon has made that very, very easy for authors to do. You basically get your file formatted per their specifications. You upload it. You say what print size you want of the book and you know, what c kind of paper, white or cream, what kind of, you know, all that. You, you fill in a form, basically, and you upload a PDF of your cover and the back. So it's like one, one uh, form that's like this. I'm going to tell you something about the cover in a second. Um, and you, publish, you, you upload all of that and hit publish. And then when someone clicks buy on Amazon, there is a printer somewhere near them that spins up, spits out one copy, and mails it to them. Wow. So there's no stock anywhere in the world. It's all print on demand. Um, so super efficient, very environmentally friendly, very easy to do. Um, it costs nothing to upload your book onto Amazon. It costs if you want to get a good cover designer and a good editor and you know, all of that, and then you're doing your own marketing as a self-published author. Um, so there's definitely costs involved, but technically it's free. <coughs> anybody can self-publish, which means there's a bunch of junk uh, that is self-published. And so as a self-published author, it's almost impossible to get on a bookshelf in a bookstore um, because they go, oh, you're self-published? No, forget it. Um, and uh, which, you know, I understand because there's a lot of junk to weed through. But um, my book is at the Red Wheelbarrow, um, which is an English bookstore here in Paris. And I walked in. Um, I didn't have the book with me because uh, it was right before it came out. And I talked to the owner and I was like, hi, so I'm, I'm a local author and my book's coming out. And I was just wondering, like, what would it take to get it on your shelves? And she said, did you self-publish on Amazon? I said, yes. And she said, then no. <laughs> and, and we had a little discussion for a while. I said, can I just show you the cover? And I showed it and she said, yeah, we'll take some of those. <laughs> So I said, note to self, next time, lead with the cover. Um, but uh, just for the, for the fun of it, so this phone, it's a girl's hand holding a phone, and it's got a little X and a little heart. That's a dating app. That's a yes and the no. And so she is, these are all the no, 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 maybe yellow shirt, red, red, no, 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 no. Guys, she's swiping through on the apps. That's the design on the cover. Anyway, that's it. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. <laughs> Is this an April Fool's joke? Please say no. Uh, congrats. That's awesome. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Yes, my Instagram is my main marketing vehicle. So again, Whitney Cubison writes, um, and I do pictures of Paris. I do dating memes. I do wine memes. I do you know all of the things that are kind of related. But yeah, I'm doing content of every other day ish. 
on my Instagram. Um, and I've done, you know, I try to do events like this. Thank you again. Um, and um, whatever opportunities come my way. But yeah, mostly Instagram is my main, main vehicle. Anything else? I don't. I just I took it down and turned it into my um, my author website. So it, the the website is actually called datingdisasters.paris. <laughs> <laughs> I bought that URL and uh, <laughs> now it's become my my author website. <laughs> Whitney, you have a great sense of humor. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was really great to speak to you guys. And book your own sale. And I take credit cards. Okay, I want to formally thank you. Thank okay. you. And I didn't mean to stop that. Does no, it's fine. I think we, I think we ran the course. I'll stick around if anybody wants to come up. I'm happy to answer more. Yes, because she's going to sign books and she's not taking any home. <laughs> I do. I take credit cards or cash. So or she's, she's ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Please don't forget, you can stay as long as you like. But don't forget to pay for your drinks. Excellent. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.